Okay, guys, here's a video on, um, well, it's pertaining to Lab 5 related to conditional execution. Uh, so this is something that exists in many programming languages. Its implementation might be a little bit slightly different than uh, in Dr. Racket, but um, nonetheless, the notion of uh, conditional execution uh, exists in most languages, any, all that I can think of. Um, and the idea here is that um, without any way to alter the course of execution of a program that's been written, the, the, the general course should be, or, or wants to be, naturally, um, top-down sequential. That is, uh, starting at the top, each and every line is executed in sequence from top to bottom until it's completed, right? It can often be that uh, we, we want to execute or have some code executed based on some sort of condition, like, well, if this is true, then do this, but, the, but otherwise do this. Or maybe there's more than one condition, right? This could be, or maybe this, or otherwise this. And notice that word otherwise that I'm using when I'm throwing around here. Uh -huh. It's something we use in English. A lot of this is very English-like, but you, you really have to think about the way we use it in English. I think we, we just ramble in English a lot of times without actually thinking about the words we're using. Uh, but here, there's, uh, there's, there's definitely reasons why particular words are using, used. And um, so, uh, this kind of a structure, selection structure, is often defined by an if-else um, in most languages, whether it's C, C++, Java, Python, or scheme uh, in its Dr. Racket implementation. So the whole notion is that we want to be able to execute some body of code or another based on the outcome of some question, right? uh, um, a predicate, which I'll call a predicate. Um, so whether that predicate is true or false, we're going to do one thing or another. Um, so both pieces of code aren't going to execute. It will be one or the other, right? And that's what we're trying to do. So let me move over to Dr. Racket and show some of uh, my thoughts on this. I've, I've got this Dr. Racket file, this RKT file, loaded for you. And this stuff should all pertain to uh, the modules or the, the, the labs within the modules. So I've got a little bit of a, a write-up at the top. It's really just talking about what I was just talking about there, right? So here's the general form though, in Dr. Racket of an if function. So they, they, in Dr. Racket, we have an if and we have a C-O-N-D conditional uh, functions, these two functions. The name of the function is if and the name of the other function is C-O-N-D, right? So the if function looks like my highlighted code here. That's its general form. Um, you have the open paren because we're going to use a function called if. This is a built-in keyword here, right? If. So the system knows when you use if, it's expecting something and knows there's a function already there. Now, this angle brackets that I have written here, these are not a, a keywords that are, that are in the software. This is um, in Dr. Racket. This is just me trying to show the format of what would be included inside of a statement like this, like a conditional statement that is an if conditional statement. All right, so you're gonna need some kind of a predicate first. So if this thing's true, if this fact or whatever, this evaluation is true, then what we're going to do is the true case code is gonna execute that, that, uh, that next line that's contained in angle brackets. All right, and in that case, that the true case executes, the false case will not execute. Okay, and then the, the whole thing's over at the ending parenthesis. Now, if the predicate is false, then the true case there, the code that, that um, creates the true case, it will, that code will not execute, all right? Because only the false code will, because the, the predicate's false. So we'll jump to the false code and the whole thing will be over, right? Boom, false code executes. So here's an example I have down here. This should help you, I think. 
I hope. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to define my own function, right? So I can define functions and I can define variables using the keyword. This is a built-in word in the system, right? The system, Dr. Rocket, knows this word define. Uh, you're beginning to be aware of that, uh, but I just want to be explicit about the use of the word keyword. <laughs> it's very important because there's a lot of keywords and some things are not keywords. And so it's safe for us to call variables, for instance, that we want to create um, words that are not keywords. See, we don't want to use keywords. So we have to be careful and kind of cognizant of those words, if being one of them, right? We couldn't define a variable to be named if. The, the system will say, you can't use that word. Uh, it's already my word. That's <laughs> basically what they're going to say, what it's going to say. All right, and so it turns out, so I wanted to create this function called max, where I could take two numbers, val1, val2, when I called it, and it would tell me which one was bigger, all right? It'll just return the bigger one, is what I'm trying to get it to do. So um, <coughs> I used the, I initially called it max, and what I discovered was that Dr. Racket already has a function called max. <laughs> so I was unable to create the name max right so i had to change it to my max but you're going to come across this kind of stuff in all programming languages um, where where you inadvertently or accidentally start to use a word as your own when it's already the system already knows the word it's been reserved for the system so we want to be careful of that as we move forward and and just be aware of the fact that when i say keyword i mean a built-in word it's built into the language you can't change it all right, so back to Dr. Fi, uh, Dr. Rack. So I had to choose my max so that I wouldn't uh, have a collision with uh, something that was already in the system. And so I've created the function my max, and I, um, it's, gonna, it's going to receive two parameters. These are input parameters. All right, and then here comes, and there's the end of it right here, right? That's the end of, of the whole function called my max. So this is the heart and soul right here of what we're doing. <laughs> so I am testing to see if val1 is great, whatever came in, whatever number, I'm expecting a number, right? If that number comes in and is greater than the second value, val2, um, then I expect that would, that would evaluate to true, right? Val1 would in fact be greater than val2. And we'll look at my, no, it's down too far. So if I typed in 10 for val1 and 2 for val2, 10 is in fact greater than 2. So true, a Boolean value, true. It's not a string. It's actually a value, Boolean value. There's true and false. It's the result of um, these, these kinds of expressions, less than, greater than, equivalent to. So then, since I have a true evaluation here, right? The condition, the predicate evaluated to true, then I want to execute the first line of code and then not the second. So I would expect 10 to print now, right? Had I done the other way around, um, to for val1 and 10 for val2 then 2 is it's false that 2 is greater than 10 so then val2 would print and not val1 all right that's the whole idea behind conditional execution that one thing will execute or another thing but not both right now condition once you've got control of that c-o-n-d allows us, the problem with, with that simple setup with the if, other languages get around this particular problem I'm about to describe. Um, other languages have other ways of getting around the issue. But one issue that could happen here is that we have multiple <laughs> options, multiple things. Um, here, even with this little simple example, it will tell me um, which one is bigger right if i if i make one bigger but what if i what if i entered five and five it's actually false 
that 5 is greater than 5. Right? The statement reads 5 greater than 5, you're going to get a false, so then val2 is going to print. But that's a 5, and they're both 5. So on the one hand, it kind of makes sense it will work. Which one is bigger? Well, they're the same. But on the other hand, I'm um, just looking to see if on the other hand, maybe we should say something <laughs> in that case, like they're equivalent or, or something like that. So we would need another case, another possible case. So we have, uh, we could handle which one's bigger than the other, but we can't handle the equivalent case, right? We need another predicate. So, um, There's, there's lots of times that this can happen where we need multiple conditions or multiple predicates that we're going to go off of. So, and that's what the COND is, is made for. So let's jump on back there and wrap this up with looking at COND. It's general form is going to look like this. All right. So just as before, I'll still need to put it in something. Right. So here I, I've created a function signature and, and, and use the if structure. Uh, right here inside of that that wrapper right so I've, I'm using a uh, conditional statement that's wrapped inside of a function signature here we have a COND conditional statement uh, that's going to be or needs to be as if we're going to use it uh, wrapped in something and I, I imagine that's going to be a, a function definition again so we'll see as we move forward but this can go on and on and on here. And these, these predicate result pairs, <laughs> we need that pair. But there could be 30 of those, 50, 100 of them. It doesn't matter, however many. It's going to be a little ridiculous if you've got 1,000 of them, right? And there should be, maybe there's probably a, a better way to handle the problem. But here in this case, for the example and the way that cond should be used, I just have three pairs. Right? And the square brackets are actually a part of the language. Right? Where the angle brackets are not, if you recall previously, I had mentioned that I just put the angle brackets in there to give it something to set it aside. And, so, and that's the case here with this one as well. The angle brackets predicate is not inside of angle brackets. The predicate is just the predicate, whatever it is. But that predicate result pair is in fact inside of square brackets so we do want it to be structured like that and then there we have the end of the cond function so we're going to look through and, and if any of these are true there's the predicates over here right so if this one's true then that will happen then result one will happen that would have been a nice predicate one result one predicate two result two i could have done it that way i guess huh all right so here we have an example that I've written up, of course, and I did it in a definition and a define. So I've got another function here that I've now created called cool. It takes one argument, some temperature. <coughs> All right, I have two, three possibilities inside the COND function. All right, so here's my predicate for my first option here, the very first one, scare, it's contained in square brackets. The left-hand side is the predicate. That's this part. This part is the result. So if this thing becomes true or is true, then I expect hot to be printed, right? And this will not happen. That will not execute, nor will that. Neither one of those will, okay? So if I call cool with 110, temperature, then I expect hot to be printed and not cold and not okay. In fact, it won't even execute any further. The moment one of these comes becomes true, it jumps to the end here. The, the, the machine won't even see that the rest of it exists, right? Because it, it makes no sense for the machine, right? If I already found one that's true, then why bother looking any further? Right, so that's what it's going to do. Now, if I put it 10 degrees in there, <coughs> I would expect that one to run. And not hot and not okay. 
right? So what's the case that's not handled with those two predicates? Well, the case that I still need to deal with is what if it is 75, right? Because we said greater than 75, less than 75, but we never said equivalent to 75. So we need a third case here. Right, so I am handling, we're using this one for our third case. And it, by the way, there's the key word there, else, E-L-S-E, -E, which translates in English to something along the lines of otherwise. So if this one's true, do this. Else, if this one's true, do this. Else, if this one's true, do this. Else, if this one's true, do this. Right? It goes on and on and on. And then finally, else or otherwise, if none of those other things are true, then do this. So how do I type 75 in? For temp, the first one would have failed, right? So we would have moved to the second one. It would have failed. So then we would have moved to the third one and we have the catch-all just else by itself, meaning if all else fails, and the only time it can is with 75, right? <laughs> so if all else fails, print OK. And there we have um, that one. There's me again right here. So conditional execution. It exists in all languages. Its format will be different. You know, we're using... Uh, prefix notation here so it's a little bit different but the keywords if and else exist in many languages C, C++, Java, Python, lots of them and the concept is the same across all it's just that we're working with prefix notation here but conceptually we have all the same thing so hopefully this will help you get going on the the current uh, I think it's lab 5 uh, conditional execution um, I I'm certain that we can do the first one and I think we can do the second one and then probably the third one too. I'd have to look back at it, but I know I can at least get you going on the first two with this video. So um, let's, let's go with it and see what we've got. And um, if there's any issues, I'll catch you guys later. Tomorrow I think is, uh, we'll be meeting. So let's see what happens. All right. Catch you later. Bye.